Hello, welcome back everybody um, uh, for our last, but um, certainly not least um, session in uh, SciPy Computational Social Science and Digital Humanities. Um, we're very pleased to have Dr. Isa Romanowska. Uh, she is a fellow um, at the Arhaus Institute for Advanced Studies uh, in Denmark. Uh, so Isa, over to you. All right, thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. I'm going to share my screen now. And if I could get thumbs up if you can see the screen. Fantastic. All right. Um, so we're going to depart a bit from the topic that was dominating this session. And to be honest, most of the other sessions uh, as well, the topic of data. So I would like to start with taking a bit of a step back and talking about what is it that we're doing and why are we doing it and, and what is the kind of structure of the, of the knowledge that we are uh, working with. So let's start with uh, this very simple graph. Uh, it comes from a book, The Model Thinker by Scott Page, which is a fantastic book and I highly recommend it. Um, and he basically drew the kind of levels of understanding that you can uh, acquire by going from initially from data, so the little dots at the bottom, uh, which if you group them, if you summarize them, uh, will become information. So when you make a graph, when you make a line, where you when you um, summarize your information, uh, your data in some some kind of form, you get you get to the level of information, and and then you know what and where and 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 when. But this is still a step below what we call knowledge. Knowledge is when you apply a model to your information, where you start to see relationship between your, uh, your the information and the data that led to that information. It is when you start to see that perhaps the square leads to the circle squared, whatever that would stand for. And this is where you, you start to kind of get the hints of what kind of processes might be behind the, the information that you acquired. So usually you achieve that when, when you start uh, modeling, modeling data. So if you run a multiple regression, you get the relationship between your variables. If you, if you do principal component analysis, then you know what is the principal component of your data, et cetera, et cetera. And then after that, there's still one more level. And, and you know, it's a bit of a big word to call it wisdom, but this is where we start to understand the system so well that we know that certain relationship they hold no matter what, and that we can interpret the data in such a way that we actually kind of know what's going to happen in the future. And there's certain there's there's a number of systems where we are actually able to do so. So um, a bit for fun, I got you this uh, this little um, this little comic thing that uh, Jens van Bergman uh, created which is obviously a commentary to the current situation with COVID and the bloody pandemic. And it basically, people and sometimes change the public health officials with uh, politicians where, you know, uh, them and the scientists, they look at the curve. We all know that curve, right? We've seen it before. And, you know, and they call it something different. They call it, oh, going down under control. Oh my God, exponential growth, right? Where a scientist, in this case, epidemiologist, they know this is exponential growth from the very start. So, you know, when, when Dr. Fauci or Frederick Simon in Spain, when they, when they look at the data, it's not that they have some more data that we don't have. They have exactly the same data. They, 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 they you know, they probably could go on New York Times or El Pais and they will get the same kind of uh, graphs that we are looking at, but they know the process behind it. And they know that that process, the epidemic spread, the, the spread of a disease follows a very certain mechanisms. And no matter what you do, whether you, you know, stand on your ears and clap your hands, or if you try no matter what, this will follow this process. So that is the wisdom, the wisdom, um, uh, the wisdom of, of knowing what process is causing the patterns in the data. All right. So Let's take, 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 take another step back and think what allows us to achieve that wisdom. And the simple answer is it's the models. It's the models of the reality around us. So let's first define what is a model because you know we're all in different um, disciplines. We all have our own models. We all have uh, you know our machine learning models or our regression models uh, and other 
types of models. So here in my illustration, you see the map of Aarhus, my current city. It's absolutely lovely. There is no sun, but then you wouldn't expect that in Denmark. And, um, and this is a model. It's a map. It's a map of the city. Um, it, shows me, it shows me how to get from my house to this lovely restaurant called St. Paulus Apotec. And it is a model in the sense that it represents the city of Aarhus, but it's not the city of Aarhus, right? I mean, to start with, it's two dimensional. And, you know, just looking around, I can confirm the city of Aarhus as well as the rest of our globe is actually in three dimensions. Um, it's also simplifying a lot of features. Um, so you have the streets and the houses, but to be honest, in most cases, those are like just shown as gray blocks, right? So this is not that if you took an, an, a satellite image of the city of Aarhus, it wouldn't look like this, but it is, it is a model of the city. And now imagine this is a cycling path. I imagine I got a, a flat tire, which happens surprisingly often here. And, uh, and a different model is necessary. So you would be surprised probably, um, but this is also a model of the city of Aarhus. This is a model of our tram, which is like a metro, except for small places. And, and it also represents the city. It is even more simplified. Um, but if you know the city a little bit, you would know that you know you have to get on uh, in Stjernaplassen, and then if you get off at Aarhus Hall, then you will be probably in the right area. And both of those models are accurate and correct. It's, it's not that they're not showing the reality. Um, but there's other models of the city of Aarhus. This is, for example, a map of geology of city of Aarhus. And I can tell you that it's definitely very precise and realistic and an accurate representation of the city, which is at the same time absolutely and utterly useless for the purpose of getting to the restaurant. So from that, let's construct the definition. Uh, a model is an abstract, a simplified representation of the world, one aspect of it usually. And it preserves some aspects of, of reality, but it doesn't preserve all of them. So from that follows pretty logically that uh, multiple models of any one systems are possible and all of them may be appropriate and accurate and correct and, and you know, fine, but it doesn't mean that they all or you know, equally useful, all right? So there are different types of models. Uh, in the background, you see this really cool model of the, uh, of the solar system, and uh, it's awesome. I mean, I, I, I would love to play with something like that. Um, and so there can be physical models. It doesn't have to be on a paper in a computer. So you have maps. This is a spatial model of something. You have regression. Uh, just just to pick up on regression, because why not? As a statistical model of relationships, uh, you can even have ideas. We we call it different things. We call it theories. We call it hypotheses uh, or ideas, and those are all conceptual models. And there are models like any other models. And then you have simulation, which is the one that I will be talking about. And the difference with simulation the, is that it's a dynamic model. So it's a model that allows you to look at the process because this is a model when you have an arrow of time. If you looked at that map of Aarhus and you had a little tiny Isa on her little bike going boop, 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 that would be a simulation. It wouldn't be a map anymore. Great, so uh, there are many different types of simulation, but there is one that is awesome. And I'm telling you it is awesome because that's my type of simulation and I absolutely love it. And other ones are fine, but this one is definitely the best. So it's called agent-based modeling. And, uh, and, and to be honest, it's, it is a little bit what it says on the tin. I mean, it is based on agents. So you've got little agents, which are those small software units, and they are highly independent and autonomous, and they interact with each other and with their environment, so the environment is pretty important, and that in interactions happen over time, right? So pretty simple. Uh, the good news for everyone who's uh, in digital humanities slash social sciences, there are no equations. There are no equations, my friends. Uh, you, can, you can deal with it without much maths, which is great. Um, so let's, let's look at the, uh, at the, at the agents. 
Um, the the important thing is that they're very they, they're individual in and they're individual in the sense that every single agent has attributes and those attributes will depend on the model you you you, you create. So this could be their age, their energy level, their wealth, their location, their preference for this type of trainers versus some other type of trainers, their political association, anything you fancy. Um, and because the combination of those attributes will be pretty unique. It means that even if you have a very large population of agents, they are all individual, they are all unique in that population. And that means that the population you're modeling is heterogeneous. And that's, that's really cool because that is not common for other types of simulation. And another thing that is also not common for other types of simulation is that they are adaptable. So they can change the rules of behavior depending on their unique circumstances. And here, again, the whoop, everyone's unique comes in. So, so it is, it is uh, super difficult to predict what they're going to do. Um, and uh, important, important note is that agents can represent individuals. So it could be separate human beings, right? But it, they do not have to be. So they just, an agent could be a molecule or a car or a household unit or even a country, if that's what you fancy. And they, they live in their virtual world and they follow certain dynamics, which are defined by you, the, the creator of the world, um, and uh, which basically are a set of rules of behavior. So the important things about those rules of behavior is that they are local. So they apply to the agents within their local circumstances. They are bounded. And uh, that's, that's, that's really cool because that goes against, and if there are any economists here, I'm so sorry. But it goes against those very common assumptions in economy models where everyone is super rational and they know everything. Uh, so here, agents can actually make stupid decisions. That's absolutely allowed. And they will not have a global knowledge. They will only know what's going to run them. Uh, and it is also flexible. So the rules of behavior can change. And not only because uh, you, know, you say, oh, and from now on, everyone does X is also because the, the agents can change their mind, um, switch political orientation, uh, decide to start a family and become a different type of agent. So pretty much anything goes. And, and I'm really hoping that, you know, from what I'm talking about, you get this kind of sense of like, does, does this resemble something, right? Like individual people with many attributes, everyone is unique, everyone has rules of behavior, they're not that rational, and they only know the local, local uh, stuff around them. Um, and, they, and they're adaptable and learn and communicate. Um, that's how the world works, right? I mean, that's how we are. It's, 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 it's how humans and societies and, you know, animals as well. Uh, let's, let's not put them in the, in the wrong bucket. Uh, that's, how, that's how we function. So, so in that sense, agent-based modeling is a basically a really simple representation of the, the way we are. However, what comes out of that, what comes from those, uh, those interactions between agents and between uh, agents and the environment is, is, is really not very intuitive. So even if you have a simple dynamic, because of the kind of heterogeneity of, of, of everything you put in the simulation, you get really counterintuitive results, which then turns out agree with the data and explain why it is so weird, uh, this weird as it is. So I will tell you now that uh, fantastically tolerant people, which have not a sliver of racism in them, can create segregated neighborhoods. Who would have thought, right? Uh, traffic jams, they can happen for no good reason whatsoever. No, no, uh, you know, broken car on the street, no, no nothing. They just happen out of, out of the blue. And that's my favorite one because I discovered that when I was doing my master's. Um, if you could give phytoplankton, so, you know, the little things that, that's, that swim in the sea and the, in the oceans, if you give them food, then, then the whole ecosystem is going to collapse. And, and I mean, I was shocked when I did it myself. I thought if you feed the basis of the ecosystem, then it's going to thrive. And it turns out everyone's going to be dead. Everyone, the phytoplankton, the zooplankton, the fishes, everyone's just going to go. So, so you get those really counterintuitive um, uh, results. And, um, and the reason why you get those is because of what the young fella here said 2000 years ago. So yeah, he was a bit ahead of time. Uh, this is Aristotle. 
And he said that very often the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And what I was just describing is the phenomenon of emergence. So the phenomenon of emergence is basically a shorthand to say that sometimes interactions within the system, um, they lead to patterns on the population level uh, behavior that are completely unexpected. And so you can study the individual element for however long you want, and you're still not going to be able to predict what the big system is going to do. So you can look at each neuron in your brain forever and ever and ever, and that's not really going to tell you why people fall in love. So for that, uh, Aristotle didn't know. He just needed agent-based model modeling. Um, but this is not the only thing that ABM can do for you. So alternative realities is something that I love the most. So you've got the computer, you've got your agents, you've got in silico laboratory for where, where, where you can do whatever you want. You want to see what increased taxation does to your agents? There you go. You want to pasture them with a drought and a climate and loads of climate change? Not a problem. The ethics committee is, is on your side. And so this is particularly important for people that study the past, because obviously it's not that we can go and ask people, oh, so how was it during the Napoleonic Wars, huh? Or, or get some data, like, you know, Neanderthals, funny enough, didn't keep any census data, bastards. So, so we don't really know what people did and how and why. And, and, and this is one of the ways of figuring that out. And the most important thing is this is all process focused. So uh, simulation and agent-based modeling will not tell, not answer any questions that starts with what, where, or, or when. But it will definitely help you answer questions that start with why and how. And, you know, to give it all a bit of a, you know, a bit uh, put uh, my money, mommy, money when my mouth is, I'll, I'll show you a little tiny case study that we've done last year. So the Roman East. You know, the Romans, the, the good old days when the Italians sometimes got somehow got their shit together and basically were all over the Mediterranean and they were ruling the world. That's time. So we focus on the east of that, uh, of that grand empire of Italians. Um, and we will not be answering the question of how did they manage to go so far without calling their mummy. Uh, we're going to answer the questions, what the heck is happening with the pottery? So as an archaeologist, we, we love our pottery. And, and Romans had, you see those red pots? They're called terra sigillata, or Samian, if you're in the UK. And, and, uh, and the cool thing about them is that they were created in workshops. So it's not that you can knock one together in your household. You have to go and buy it from a specific workshops. And there are different types. In fact, there were five types, thankfully, because more would be complicated. Uh, so they were produced here in Turkey and, and here, and one probably in Cyprus, and one came from Italy. And, um, and what we can do is we can look through archaeological sites and see, okay, so the, the, the terra sigillata of given type was found here and here and here and here during this time and this time. And then uh, I created those uh, um, cumulative probability curves. So it basically shows you how popular each type has been over time. So those are the curves, and you can see that the red one was starting in the second century uh, BC, was the most popular type of terra sigillata, and then it kind of, around the uh, kind of break of millennium, it, it started going down, whereas uh, the uh, Italian sigillata, the yellow one, went up, other ones started kind of picking up in their popularity. All right, so we've got the, so this is the, the you know, when you come back, go back to the first graph, this is the information, right? We took the data points and we turned it into lines. And now we have trends. But that doesn't tell us what has caused it, right? So obviously we created an agent-based model. Um, and we based it on an economy, mo eco uh, economy model uh, by Gintis. And, uh, and it basically um, consists of, uh, oh, sorry. It basically consists of uh, little agents who have a strategy uh, of buying things. So they trade goods between each other and they have, uh, and they have certain lists of what they should actually get. But they, uh, they have to be scored at how well they did in terms of buying whatever they need on the list. And as they kind of do the, um, 
the, the economic exchange, we tested three scenarios of how they can improve their, their trading behavior. Uh, so they can, uh, so this is kind of jump towards cultural transmission here. Uh, so they had, they had three strategies and those are very simple strategies. So one was basically innovation. You just kind of tweak your strategy until you see, well, until you see that, uh, that your results are better. The second one was uh, social learning uh, bias transmission, where you kind of look around and say, ha ha, the trader there, she seems to be pretty good. I'm going to copy what she's doing. So you get good information about, about, um, uh, about uh, you know, how everyone else is doing, and then you choose the best and copy their strategy. And the third one, you do the same, but you actually don't know who's doing well better than you and who's doing well. So it's a, it's a pretty random process where we just copy other traders and their strategies. All right, so um, that was a really like quick and uh, dirty model, but um, you know, it was quick and dirty data. Uh, but it turns out that as per usual in uh, studies of the past, we didn't have much data to kind of put in. Uh, so we had to kind of sweep through loads and loads of uh, parameter values. And we used this technique called approximate Bayesian computation to do so. Um, and in this graph, you can see that in all combinations of all sorts of parameters, da, 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 um, you can ignore this whole part of the of the graph. This is how I, the, the, the algorithm basically kind of crawls towards the real answers. And so at step 13, we kind of say, okay, I think we are pretty clear what happened. It turns out that the independent strategy, so basically tweaking your strategy without looking at anyone else, explains the data best. Um, this was of a grand uh, disappointment to one of the co-authors who uh, argued his whole uh, career that it was the other way around. But, you know, this is the fun of simulation, right? Like, you don't know what the result is going to be. Um, and, and that suggests uh, that there was pretty limited contact and pretty limited eco economic integration between those markets, something that, you know, people have been arguing back and forth for, for, for centuries almost. I mean, they started in, like, early 1920s. Crazy. Um, so, so in this case, we could actually leverage the data we had to basically say, well, it supports this model. This is this is the knowledge we get out of this this data. And we even looked at the at the more detail with uh, independent learning. So again, those are pretty boring graphs, but uh, this is all like the um, priors and posteriors for the Bayesian. And, and we figure out that in order to fit the data well, uh, the agents would have to have pretty low number of economic interactions and pretty low rate of innovation that would happen kind of on the on the on the middle range in terms of the how often do they do they innovate so often innovate but not too much there you go so so we know not, we know something more about the romans uh now and uh you know for all details and and the code and everything please um uh, go to the uh, paper. It was uh, the first author was uh, my student, and uh, and uh, and I also wanted to just show you the really cool uh, picture of our supercomputer that we used in order to do the the, the algorithm. So this is Mario Nostrum in Barcelona, and uh, we used to uh, I used to work there as the head of the social science and digital humanities. And it's if you're in Barcelona, go and visit it. It's awesome. I mean, it's a supercomputer in a church. Thank you so much, Isa. That was uh, that was really lovely, um, really cool to see. Um, so uh, again, if you have a question um, for Isa, we have a few minutes, so go ahead and pop that in the Q and A or raise your hand. Um, and we'll start with Fulgert. Um, he asks, which Python libraries do you use for these yes. agent-based models? So in Python, we've got Mesa, and now there's also a a new uh, library called uh, PyABM. Uh, so we've checked with the Pi ABM and it's, it's, it has pretty poor performance, but you know it's just going to get better. And Mesa, Mesa, M E S A, is uh, is the main library we 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 would use for ABM in Python. Um, but the important thing to kind of remember is that um, um, is that um, Python is object oriented. You don't actually need a library. I mean, you do a class of agents, and then you have instances each agent, and they have Attributes, yeah, <laughs> and you know, creating a grid is it's just a matrix, you know, two dimension my matrix. It's, it's, it's really not complicated, so you can you can code it from scratch. That's great. Um, 
we're going to turn it over to Mike. Um, he asks, he has something I've been wondering too, which is if the field doesn't have these kind of analytic or mathematical uh, formulas or representations, how do you typically communicate your models um, in writing? Um, he asks, mm -hmm. do you pseudocode or what? Um, so there are some protocols that we use to describe the models, uh, but um, yes, that it, it's 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 tricky in the sense that you're not giving the the very exact mathematical representation of the model. Uh, we always share the code, and actually, as far as archaeologists are concerned, they're really good with sharing the ABM code. Uh, historians probably as well, but there's only been like three applications, so. I'm not going to comment on that. Um, so it usually, the, the good thing about it is it's all in, done in very familiar, familiar terms. So, um, so that means that it's actually quite easy to explain saying, OK, so agents do this at time this, and then they do something else. And if this happens, then they, they do this. But uh, most of the time, people just uh, you know, have to either look into it or, um, or, or basically believe us. This is what it is. So yeah. Great. I'm going to turn it over um, to David's question. Uh, he wants to, he's wondering if you could talk about the realism um, of these mm -hmm. models um, and when do you think they need to be more or less detailed? Um, I know the map is not the territory, but sometimes you want a really good map. So I like um, that analogy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the map is not the territory. I mean, it's, it's, it's a good old one. Um, so, um, this depends on the question you ask, right? So for, for archaeology, for history, a lot of the questions we would be asking are related with explanation, in which case you're looking for the processes that drive certain things. But uh, I can tell you, because that's also what I worked on last year, when it comes, for example, to COVID dynamics, you want the most realistic and precise predictions possible. At which point you will definitely, you know, you have to, th there's a trade off. You cannot have everything. You cannot have, you know, very general map that is also precise and realistic. So, so depending on what you want to use the model for, uh, if you want to have, uh, I don't know, evacuation uh, strategy for uh, a, a building and you use agent based models, then you probably want to be precise and realistic. And the kind of generality of it doesn't matter, right? So, so yeah. A research question will drive your decisions. Yeah, there's always that trade-off between parsimony and realism, right? Absolutely. Uh, Jake, Jake is wondering what software you use uh, to approximate Bayesian computation. And then I'm going to add my own question after this. Yeah, there's a, there's a Python library. Let me, um, you know what, if you read the paper, we, we, we cite which Python library. So there's a Python library that just makes it very easy. And then we used uh, Pandora, which was the BSC, so the Supercomputing Center in-house kind of software to run it on a supercomputer, but that's actually not necessary. You can you can run it on a normal computer without it. So um, the ABC, uh, Proximate Bayesian Computation, is, is used quite widely, especially among ecologists. So so it is actually very well developed. There's there's no 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 issues there. Okay, great. Well, it seems like we're just at a time. Um, I was going to ask why you think agent-based modeling is so um, unpopular in fields like political science and economics, but I'm going to try to get your take on that um, <laughs> privately um, offline. But thank you so much, uh, uh, Isa, and thank you to everyone. Um, this is the last track in our first ever computational social science and digital humanities track here at SciPy, um, but we hope to do it again. Thank you so much, Isa. I didn't want to uh, take up too much more people's time, but I was always struck that, like in political science and economics, they kind of mm -hmm. like look down on agent-based modeling or something as inferior to these closed-form analytic um, 